All right. So without further ado, uh, who is speaking? I am speaking, Adam Good. I am a senior strategist at Parsons CKO. I've been doing uh, digital engagement in the nonprofit space for about 12 or 13 years now, um, coming from a user experience information architecture background uh, in the early mid uh, aughts, I think is what they were called, knots, 2012, I don't know. A lot, it feels like a long time ago. A lot's changed since then. but. Uh, uh, yeah, started out working um, primarily with user experience, information architecture on really large enterprise size uh, designs and redesigns uh, for clients like Brookings Institution, uh, Amnesty International, UNICEF, uh, really helping them think through their, their architectures for their sites and their experiences. Uh, and over time, got more and more interested in the types of whole scale organizational change uh, that need to happen to help uh, organizations, particularly nonprofits, better engage with their audiences. Um, we saw a lot of, um, you know, at, at the time, um, and I think unfortunately still, uh, there's there can be a, a fairly myopic uh, focus on websites as a, um, the most important channel, um, and often to the the detriment of thinking about holistic contact engagement overall. Uh, and how that needs to be integrated across the organization, uh, particularly if you're a large organization with lots of different audiences, lots of different programs. So, uh, yeah, so I help um, uh, uh, help organizations really understand uh, what their digital engagement challenges are and help them figure out a, a road forward from there. So without further ado, um, we're going to talk about contact models uh, and the importance of a contact model why you need one and how to go about creating it. Um, if, you, if you come from a, a background where you are doing fundraising or CRM management or email list management, um, you know, contact model, uh, you know, some people say, oh, is this audience segments or is this email list? Uh, is, is this you know, database design? And the answer is, is a little bit of yes and a little bit of not exactly. Um, and I'll say why. Um, the 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 reason that it uh, you know the, the 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 similarities between all those things is that it comes down to how you understand your contacts, um, who they are, what they're like, what they care about, and what they do with your organization. Um, and part of that is often in an email list, and maybe another part is in the CRM, and maybe another part is in the spreadsheet that a particular program keeps. Um, we emphasize the contact model piece of it because it's more of a, a, a conceptual uh, mental model that can help you inform how you engage with your contacts across different channels. Um, and we approach this the way we approach um, all of our work uh, through the lens of engagement architecture, which is really about thinking about the engagement points and the experiences that you wanna provide to your audiences that are driven by your strategy, but supported by the people in your organization, the processes they follow, and the platforms that they use. Uh, so this isn't a webinar about how to choose the best email platform. Um, it's, a, it's a webinar about how to understand contact models and think of them from the standpoint of all the engagement experiences you want to provide to your audience, uh, audiences, and the platforms and processes of people that need to be in place to really make the most of that. Um, so that's just a highlight in engagement architecture and the approach that we take. So question, what is a contact model? I like to start with this slide because I always like to start with some humor, keep going with humor as the case may be. Um, contact model. So contact, one of my, one of my favorite, all-time favorite science fiction movies about a radio astronomer who detects uh, signals from out in space uh, that are alien life and she has to decode them. Um, so uh, beyond the fact that contact model, it, it works from a title standpoint, it is about making contact and it is about getting clear signal and, and, and knowing what to do with that signal. Um, and then uh, model, because when, whenever I think of model, I think of uh, the Zoolander movies with male models that uh, get swept up in all kinds of international intrigue uh, and, and, uh, and succeed despite themselves. Um, so contact models that we're talking about today But what is it? I mentioned before uh, that a contact model, it's, it's really a mental model uh, that outlines the key information you need to know about your specific contacts 
to power meaningful engagement. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of break down the, the different elements of this. A mental model, again, um, in that it can be used to inform actual implementation. So you can take things that you know from your contact model and implement them in your CRM or your email or your fundraising uh, database or you know what, whatever systems you have. It has to start from a clear mental model that isn't dependent on any particular system. Um, the, the model outlines key information. Um, so instead of just saying, oh, well, what, what all can we know about our audiences? Um, the answer is, you know, a lot, <laughs> a lot. In fact, you know, most modern CRMs have lots and lots of uh, um, sort of standard default fields and allow you the flexibility to create a lot of additional fields. Um, so if you start from a, uh, a platform first basis, you'll probably quickly get overwhelmed. Um, so again, starting with a mental model of saying, okay, what do we actually need to know? What do we need to know? What do we want to know? Um, about contacts, about specific contacts, um, so that we can say, oh, let's find all the people that are interested in um, uh, disinformation campaigns. Let's find all the people that are interested in child hunger in the South. Thinking through your contacts, your audiences, the specifics of what you want to know about them is, is really at the heart of the contact model. And ultimately, that's to power meaningful engagement. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not we're not keeping a, a, a giant list of email addresses just because we like giant lists of email addresses. I mean, maybe some of us are, but, you know, the most part for the most part, we, we have contact lists, we have CRMs so that we can better reach out to people and ask them to do the things that we would like for them to do to help us advance our mission. So the contact model is all about defining what the information is about those contacts, what type of engagements you want them to have, so that then you can more effectively uh, implement that in your platforms, figure out where you need to integrate your CRM with your email, for instance, um, figure out what kind of processes you need to have in place inside your organization, so that you know, there aren't a million spreadsheets with duplicate contents everywhere, or 17 instances of a CRM, um, which I kind of exaggerate, but we, we definitely um, have worked with clients that have, you know, every, every department just starts their own MailChimp account. Um, and that leads to a, a lot of inefficiencies, opportunity costs, uh, as well as potentially uh, uh, disgruntled, um, disgruntled audiences. They're getting lots of emails from lots of different people. So the contact model is our way of approaching uh, this question of how to effectively think about our audiences and plan holistically as an organization uh, for how to engage them. Right. But, but why contact models? And uh, you'll, you'll see this slide uh, throughout. It's just my uh, little reference to the Zoolander joke where um, there's this vast conspiracy to use male models as assassins. Uh, and uh, this guy explains this to Zoolander um, that, you know, male models are being used as assassins um, because they're gullible and not very intelligent. And he explains the whole thing and Zoolander goes, I have one question. Why male models? So we'll keep saying, but why contact models? Because uh, it's good to keep repeating the question. All right. So the core of it is you need to know who you're dealing with. Who are the people that are actually engaging with the organization? Chances are, you know a lot about some people, a little bit about some people, and not a lot about a lot of people, right? You might know a name and an email address. Um, and if your tracking's good, you might be able to go in and see what emails they've opened up, if they've donated, if they've attended events. But chances are you're only getting pieces of that puzzle. Um, and, and chances are that those pieces have to come from different systems, different uh, parts of the organization, um, so that you're not getting a clear holistic picture that can serve all, all the different constituents of your organization. So you need to know who they are. We, we, there's a lot that you can know about your audiences. We like to break it down into three, these three categories. Um, who they are this is the basic information about them. Um, what they care about is, you know, what do they care about? Why are they engaging with your organization? Uh, particularly if you're an organization that covers lots of different areas of, of work, as is the case with, with a lot of advocacy groups, with a lot of think tanks. Um, you know, they have such broad, you know, many of them have very broad portfolios. 
And so one, you know, one contact might only care about 1% of your portfolio or 5% of your portfolio. You need to know that um, about them. Uh, and then the, the final bucket is what they've done. So these are what they have done in regards to your organization. Are they opening emails? Have they donated? Have they come to an event? Have they spoken at an event? Did they used to work for you? That's one that, uh, that's one that most organizations don't actually track um, in, in any official capacity within their CRM, um, which is crazy to me because so many people, especially in the nonprofit space, have people coming through their system, right? Interns, maybe they work there for a few years and maybe, and then they go on. And they go on to um, uh, places of power and authority. Um, and wouldn't it be nice to have a, a, a record in your CRM of like, hey, all the interns that we had focusing on this, where are they now? Um, different programs might have bits of that information, um, but chances are your, your organization doesn't have a holistic view of that. Uh, and it can be really important. So you need to know who you're dealing with. Just a couple basics and examples you know, who they are, their name, their email, at least, <laughs> ideally their organization and their role. Um, and again, this, this is a little bit tailored and specific to, to think tanks and advocacy organizations. You'll see some of the use cases uh, in here are, are particular to that, but, you know, maybe organization doesn't matter as much if you're doing um, kind of direct grassroots fundraising, um, although still nice to know. Uh, so um, these are some of the basics, just basics of who they are. Um, what they care about. So topics, which issues do they care about? Which regions? If, you, if you're uh, an organization that covers global issues, what are the regions that people are, uh, care about or are coming from? Um, if you're a national organization but have particular focus in particular regions, good to know which regions your contacts care about. Um, content preferences and communications needs. It's good to know if um, people really care about getting uh, issue briefs or memos or explainers so that you can go, ah, this person really likes explainers, but whenever we send them something that's longer than an explainer, they don't read it. They're really getting to know what kind of content they're, they're interacting with and using, uh, as well as their communications needs. Um, this is part of the contact model because it, it's something that is frequently uh, overlooked in organizations or sort of looked at just through the lens of the, the platform where you can say, oh, well, we need people to be able to unsubscribe. Yes, but that is a subset of the idea of, of, of knowing your, your audience's communications needs. Um, this is particularly important, again, if you have lots of different areas where people might end up on different lists, they're not sure how they got there, you know, what, what are they hearing from you and when? Uh, and then finally, what they've done, again, this can run the gamut from signing up for events, meeting with staff, donating, signing a petition, um, having a phone conversation. Um, we kind of uh, did a mix of, of items here because a lot, uh, a lot of focus is normally on the website and what kinds of tracking and data we can get from the website. Did people donate? Did people donate? Did people sign up? Did people take an advocacy action? Um, those are easier in some ways to track um, in, in terms of like discrete interactions uh, that you can track and get, get data on. But a lot of the particularly more important influence uh, generation work comes with conversations, comes with in-person meetings, um, which may or may not be uh, tracked. And if they're tracked, they may not be well communicated um, by program staff, maybe in the CRM or in the spreadsheet. Um, so you know, if someone, the ideal situation is that you're able to pull up anyone that your organization engages with and say, oh, wow, they care about this. They work in this senator's office. Oh, the last contact we had with them was they signed up for an event. They didn't come to it. But then, oh, I just see the last week that they talked with one of our senior, you know, our senior program staff. Having that holistic picture means that you know, however you want to interact with that particular contact, you have a holistic view of how they've been engaging with your organization. But why? Why contact models? Again, why? So the, 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 the superpower of the contact model um, is that it helps you find and engage specific contacts, contacts throughout your evolving relationship. Um, so a, a really strong and well-implemented contact model can support fairly complex 
cross-channel use cases like this. Um, so the, the things that sort of are triggered by the contact model are, are green, bold, and underlining to really uh, emphasize their importance. Um, but the, so the, the use case here is that alert me, alert me like I'm a, I'm a program lead. Um, I'm the, uh, or I'm a, I'm a program coordinator. So alert me when a new contact from the State Department registers for an event on national security so that I can notify the national security program lead so they can send a personal email. Um, so this gets really into the heart of what it means to build relationships, uh, leveraging uh, digital tools, uh, and leveraging data. So the, the default case is someone signs up for an event with a name and email, and they get a response that says, thanks for signing up. Here's the link to the event. And then, you know, maybe, uh, you know, if the events team is on top of things, or if your outreach team or whoever handles events, maybe they'll get a couple reminders before the event. Um, that's kind of entry level. People should, you know, hear back from your organization. This takes it many steps further by saying, hey, we don't, you know, we do, we want people to come to events, but the most important thing that we might get from events is someone that we haven't talked with before at a particular organization on a particular topic we care about. So uh, let's say the national security program lead says, hey, I really care about contacts from the State Department. I want to know when contacts from the State Department are going to come to an event so that I can reach out directly and say, hi, I haven't seen you before. You know, can we meet up before the event? You know, what are you interested in? And you're starting to build those relationships. Um, and so there's, there's a, lot, a lot that can happen here. And you can, uh, you can implement your, per, your platforms and your processes to do this kind of work. But it has to start from a very clear contact model of you know you have your system has to have a way of knowing these things in order to get back results like this. So you need to be able to say, okay, the person is from the State Department. Um, the person is interested in national security. The person is a new contact, um, and you know the the person has registered for an event. These are all things that need to be baked into the contact model before you can get to this point. Um, and a great starting point for figuring out these kinds of use cases is, particularly if your organization runs events, um, sit down with the, the person who runs the events for a particular program or for, you know, for, uh, yeah, let's say for a particular program. So if there's a national security program, the person who runs the events, who, what's the most valuable outcome for your events? Sit down with them and say, you know, if someone signs up for an event, who do you want to be there most? And then if you had a magic wand, what would you do if you knew that they registered? Um, how do you want to engage? What are the kind of people you normally get? And what do you want us to do next with them? So this starts to build out a picture of the types of things that uh, your internal stakeholders uh, care about and want to know when they think about your contacts. Um, and, and this should be uh, cross organization. So you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll work with people who are in communications and they're doing emails. And then fundraising is doing another thing. And, and maybe they're also doing emails with communication support or siloed from communications. The contact model is meant to support audience engagement across the board um, by, by saying, when we think of a contact, what are the different ways that we can engage with them? And what do we need to know to engage them effectively? Um, and having these kinds of conversations across organizational silos uh, it is really important because then it becomes, it's a way of, of it uh, being less of a turf war, right? Where programs are protected, protective of their contacts, where fundraising is protective of their high value donors um, for good reason, right? The, the, those, those, those units are, are um, protective of their contacts for good reason because they don't want to overwhelm them. They want to have a say and, and sense of control over the messaging. But there's so many um, lost opportunities with that kind of, with that kind of siloing. So this is this is one reason why why you want to do it. Again, why contact models? Okay, so where do I start? But how contact models? So this is just a, a an exercise that that you can do, and we'll send this deck over afterwards. Um, list the attributes of your contacts. Just sit down, just yourself, 
or with a, with a colleague or with a team and fill out the attributes of your contacts in these three areas. Who are they? Okay, we, we know their name, we know their email, we care about organization, we care about role, we, we care about state, we care about zip code. Right, we, we, we care about hair color, right? There might be things that are specific to your organization um, that are they're kind of about the person, um, uh, not you know their interests or their activity. Um, again, look at what they care about. Um, for what they care about, you, you wanna uh, remember your taxonomies. So when you think, well, I don't know what they care about. If you're not sure what those categories are, take a look at your, at your taxonomies, particularly in, in, in your website. Taxonomy is a kind of a fancy way of saying categories or groups or segments, uh, labels, um, different categories for thinking of how th people might interact with your organization. So you can look at your website information architecture um, or menus or navigation. So if you have something that's a topic section and covers lots of topics, there you go. <laughs> that's one of your taxonomies. Um, you can also think about hashtags on social media, um, folders that, that teams use. Um, for uh, internal sorting, right? So if you're talking to program teams, like, hey, how do you sort your emails when you're talking to all these um, uh, grant makers or grantees? How do you categorize them? Um, because, you know, maybe grant category or grant year um, is a, um, a, a, an element that you need to include uh, in your list of contract uh, contact attributes. Um, so again, these are some starters. Uh, these are the ones that we you know, talked talk about a little bit before, but again, these are only starters, and they may or may not be relevant um, uh, to your to your organization. Um, I can't stress enough that a critical part of this process is that it should be a convening moment across organizational silos. So, you know, communications isn't building up their contact model, and fundraising isn't building up their contact model. Right? We are aiming for a holistic picture. Uh, of a person and of groups of people that our organization engages with. So the more that you can bring stakeholders from, from different parts of the organization together, together um, the better your contact model is going to be, the more buy-in you're going to have by people in those departments um, because they see the point of creating a contact model, they see the benefit of it, um, they see the power of it, um, and then they also see that it's a group effort. Right, that it's you know the whole organization getting together behind this idea of a holistic view, um, and with that holistic view, your organization will be much better equipped to fine tune your engagement with audiences uh, in a way that can be documented in process and trained <laughs> training provided for people to do, so that you avoid those concerns. Um, that teams tend to have. Oh, I don't want other people, you know, sending fundraising emails to my high value donors, or this person just comes to speak at events. I don't want him to get any donors or any donation asks. If those are baked into a model that the whole organization agrees on, those won't happen. It takes some work to get there. But again, as with most things, the solution is collaboration, transparency, uh, and then governance not you know grabbing your own piece of the pie and, and, and taking it back to your office and you can eat the pie by yourself um so again doing this with people uh you know, cross functional teams cross departmental teams uh can be uh is really how you should do it okay so another key piece of this is to create use cases um and this is where, going back to that example I had of, you know, thinking of it as like the, you know, the old Rolodex model or the database. Oh, I want to find this needle in a haystack, something very, very specific. I want to find a certain person or a certain type of person or a certain group of people so that I can do something, right? So I want to find people at the State Department that have attended three events on, um, uh, disinformation so that I can reach out and ask them to speak on a panel that we're putting together on disinformation. So those are the types of use cases that you want to generate as much as possible. Um, and while you're doing that, you're going to uncover parts of your contact ecosystem that you that you didn't even know existed. So as someone is, is filling this out, they'll say, this is what I want to find, but this is how I, I currently find it. I have a spreadsheet 
where I track all this. And you go, oh, cool, let's see the spreadsheet. And they'll show you the spreadsheet and you'll see all these categories, all these ways that they're uh, you know, putting in information about their contacts that can be baked into the contact model and that really must be accounted for, right? If, if you're to create a holistic contact model. Uh, again, 90% of the insight is gonna come from within inside the house um, with people who are doing the work in different ways. So finding those spreadsheets, finding their email list going, okay, what kind of emails do you send? Who do you send emails to? And they go, oh, well, we have this email segment that's for you know people that have signed up for an event but haven't attended. You go, oh, okay, why do you have that? So that we can you know, send them event recaps with a reminder to uh, make sure to attend next time. Uh, so some way of deepening engagement with a specific audience segment. Um, again, doing this across the organization really helps you see, you know, what does fundraising care about when they when they think about wanting to find uh, contacts? What are they looking for? What is program looking for? What is comms, media, et cetera, et cetera, looking for? Those are all things that should be part of the contact model, even if all information based on those things isn't equally accessible to all different groups, right? So that's where the fact that this is a model comes into play. Whereas, you know, you're not saying if you have, you know, let's say you have Salesforce, three instances of, instances of MailChimp and another email platform that, uh, you know, Pardot, that's the official one, but people use MailChimp because they go rogue, right? Never happens, but, you know, maybe, maybe occasionally. Um, what you're not starting with is let's put everything into Salesforce or here's the Salesforce list, you know, put all these segments into all these other platforms. It's not where you're starting. You're starting with the model um, so that you can clearly see what the different attributes of contacts are, what you want to know about them for what reasons, so that then you can make informed uh, plans and decisions about how to um, operationalize the contact model. And one of the key ways of doing that is um, uh, the, the use cases. All right, so getting into using the contact model. So again, it's all about um, implementing it and operationalizing it, um, which I guess are kind of two different ways of saying the same things, but I really like operationalize, even though it's a little bit of a wonky term because it means you know, put it in operation. Um, and operation should be an ongoing thing. Uh, you need to have documentation, you need to have governance uh, to make this actually work. So in order to get there, um, part of your work is determining where those contact attributes are stored. So this is kind of once you've created the contact model, you'll probably have heard these things along the way, note them down kind of to the side. Um, you know, as people are saying, oh, I really wanna find the these you know people state department employees who care about this and have come to events oh i find them through my spreadsheet that's one of your sources of contact attributes that's part of your contact ecosystem um and you know finding where all of those are is is a, is a key first step to actually really getting traction uh with making your contact model work um and it's 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 part of you know overarching road mapping efforts that organizations really need to undertake, which is who are we talking to and what do we know about them? Who knows, who knows, who knows what and where is it hidden? Um, because uh, I think I missed a slide earlier. Um, because part of the reason you should do this, ah, yeah, there we go. Double clicked over somehow, um, is that chances are right now, uh, your current contact model is busted. If it's not busted, um, it's ad hoc or scattered or distributed. You know, most organizations don't have this clear single source of truth model for who contacts are. Um, they have what I kind of think of as like a distributed contact ecosystem. So we have email system or systems. <laughs> we have CRMs. So many organizations have lots of different email systems in place, multiple CRMs, in addition to different donor databases, different, you know, maybe personas that uh, the marketing team created three years ago and um, people like and have responded to and, and kind of reference once in a while, but they haven't really 
you know, been leveraged fully. Um, spreadsheets, spreadsheets are great. Spreadsheets are great because they structure content in a, in a clear, hopefully clear way. Um, they're not as great because often they're not shared. Um, so chances are uh, we've, we've come across this time and time again, an organization that has programs doing programmatic work, they'll each have their own spreadsheet of their contacts, how they think about them, how often they contact them. Maybe that effectively is their CRM for their program. And then they just use email to email people directly, all of which can be fine. But that's, you know, information around contacts is trapped away in all of these places. Um, so a key part of taking that contact model you have is understanding where that information lives now, um, all the places that it might live. And then get back. Okay. Um, identify and close gaps in attributes, storage, or collection. So this is where you say, hey, our contact model says we need, we need to know these 20 things about our contacts uh, in order to engage them effectively. We need to know these 20 things. Then you can say, okay, 15 of these are being collected, five are not being collected anywhere. So we need to figure out where to collect them, where to facilitate or solicit them um, from clients. So often this will be, uh, you know, on an event sign up. If, you know, if we want to know someone's organization, if that really, really matters um, to our more granular, you know, impactful engagement, if we want to know their organization, let's put it as a field on the event sign up. And you know, many organizations do this, but many organizations don't. So saying, hey, where, where, are, where can we possibly get at the, the data that we don't have, the attributes that we don't have, um, and, and, and look to fill those. This is where you're also looking at duplications, right? Where you know, uh, one field is being collected across half of the platforms, like, okay, Okay, then we need to make the other half of the platforms collect that or kind of synchronize them or, or distill them down. Um, almost always, you want to get down to fewer systems that more people understand and have buy in it into uh, and process about rather than seven instances of MailChimp. Um, that's not always exactly the case. Um, you know, I, I'm definitely not a, a firm believer in everything has to be in one system. Um, but Someone needs to know where everything is in which systems. And then once everything is known from, you know, from the systems map, the systems have to justify their existence as separate systems. So you have to say, okay, well, we have this email platform that lets us do X, Y, and Z, and it gives us consistent branding and consistent, uh, you know, quality control and visibility into contacts. So why do you have a MailChimp instance? Oh, well, we didn't know how to do this or this. Okay, well, we have a training doc for that now. So now we're going to roll down your MailChimp instance because you can use this. Right? It's a lot of organizational change that goes into that. Um, but you know, the, the goal is to get to a map of your systems and platforms, what they do, how they interact with contacts, and then you know, provide governance and guidance uh, for the people who are actually doing the work. Um, okay, so uh, then the, the, the second step, I think I've already touched some of these, is creating technical requirements for meeting your use cases. Um, some of those uh, use cases that you establish might current be, you know, they might be possible by your current platforms. Um, you know, a lot of people get a little anxious about doing a contact modeling exercise because they say, you know, we don't have time for a strategic exercise or we're, we're, we're not going to be able to switch CRM or, you know, we're, our CRM is paid for the next year. And you know it's not it's not time to to move or consolidate or we just replaced our email system and even though we're not happy with it there's a lot of fatigue so we don't want to replace it. All that can be well and good, but that doesn't need to stop you from implementing some things now, right? So you can go through prioritization exercises with the use cases and say, you know, which of these are really important to us, and which of them could we implement now. So the the uh, adding the adding the, the single field on the event sign up for organization is like a perfect example. Hey, we'd really like to know people's organizations. Where do we get most of our new emails? Oh, from event signups. Let's add that to the form. And then, as as with most tactical uh, conversations or considerations, you might get 
people that say, oh, well, we don't want to put a required field on the, <laughs> on, on the sign up to de deter signups. That's, that's not, that, that doesn't do away the fact that you want to understand their organization. So then you go, okay, well, do we send a follow up that asks for their organization? Or when they sign in, do they have to put their organization? Like really dive into um, the, the tactical experience of, of getting at that information that you as an organization have deemed an important part of your contact model. Chances are you can start to get at some of that information. Um, the, the other thing is as you're, as you're identifying all of those contact sources in your contact ecosystem, you can update, you know, it, often organizations will have kind of what I call like a soft core <laughs> of, of like a CRM where we'll, we'll do, we'll do, they will have a CRM or they will have an email list or they will have a donor database. And that's kind of the most complete-ish, centralized-ish uh, contact space. Um, and maybe you can do more effective things with that just by adding in a couple fields that you know most programs use in one of their spreadsheets. Right? You can say, oh, no, none of the programs like using the CRM because they can't put in this information. Okay, we'll put in those categories, put in those fields, those taxonomies into the CRM um, uh, you know, model um, uh, or the CRM implementation so that you can encourage those programs to use the CRM, right? So look for those opportunities to start making change. You know, it's, it's not a rip out everything and replace everything that almost never works well. Um, so chances are you'll be able to do some of those things. Um, if there are significant obstacles to meeting your use cases, that's when you really wanna start looking into technical enhancements, um, integrations or replacements. Um, and this is where the rubber really hits the road, particularly with thinking about new email systems, um, because the, the email CRM space is evolving so rapidly and so many um, uh, email platforms are effectively fully fledged, very capable CRMs as well, um, that you can't really go, you know, if you're, if you're unsatisfied with, with email, if you're like, I, I hate writing emails in this thing, like no one likes it, it's outdated. We pay too much money for it, we think. Um, when you're looking at that problem, realize that it's a contact engagement challenge, right? It's a contact engagement challenge, not an email software challenge. Because the email is just one way of getting in touch with your contacts, asking them to do things, getting information back from them, and ultimately, that activity around your contact needs to reside somewhere. Um, and one of the biggest, loosest, grayest, weirdest areas is the whole email CRM integration. And there's a lot of like a lot of big name standard CRMs like Salesforce say, oh, well, we've got this product that seamlessly integrates with, with our CRM. And when you get into the use cases, it can actually be a lot more uh, challenging or problematic um, than they make it seem. So this is where, you know, as in, as in most, well, in, in everything where you're looking at systems, look at your technical requirements. Um, and those should be based on real life use cases that have been developed by, you know, input collaboration and consensus. Um, because any product is going to say, oh yeah, we integrate. We integrate with this system. We integrate with this system. But not until you get into the details of I want system X to do A when it interacts with system B, right? Getting very specific is critical to seeing, uh, you know, what, how systems can be flexed or stretched to do the specific things you want to do, um, or when you might need to have a different system to do the specific things you want to do. Okay. Another key part of um, operationalizing the contact model is to show it off. Right, and celebrate what it enables. And this is a, a, a big part of uh, the organizational change um, aspect of things is that, that you know, <laughs> first rule of organizational change is people hate change, right? <laughs> even if they're unhappy with the current situation, even if parts of it bother them, if you start telling them, oh, you gotta, you gotta tear up your spreadsheet, you gotta put it in this system now, they're gonna be pissed off. <laughs> they're, they're not gonna be happy about it, uh, uh, you know, most likely unless, uh, unless they're a little crazy and are just like, oh, I love learning new systems every day. Uh, chances are that's probably not the case. 
Um, so you need to start from a place of, hey, we have this contact model. If we implement it well and everyone consistently, you know, sort of follows the standards that we've developed to together, you can do things like this. And that's where you have an advocate who is, you know, in, in maybe the um, disinformation program who developed that use case above about, you know, national security, uh, um, State Department event attendee sign up. And you say, hey, because we did this, I've created five more, you know, I, I've developed five more contacts at the State Department that are meaningful, that matter to the work that I'm doing and that matter to the organization. And then other programs can go, oh, wow, gosh, I didn't know that we could do that kind of that kind of thing, right? And chances are they might want to do the exact same thing or it'll get them thinking of, oh, if you can do that, you know, could you also, could I also get a list of all of the people who have ever worked here in this program and who are now at the World Bank? And you can go, oh, cool, let me check out the contact model. Yes, we can do that. <laughs> because as part of the process, we identify that you know, people who worked here was an attribute um, people's organization now is an attribute, um, and uh, you know their their topic area is an attribute. So yeah, we can we can do that. We can run that query for you. You'll have it tomorrow, or you'll have it in an hour. Or pull up the CRM, do collect this, <laughs> click these three things. There's your list. There you go. Um, you really need to build up that that uh, sort of uh, I don't want to say aggressive promotion, but that sounds a little too aggressive. Uh, probably because I use the word aggressive, um, that that very uh, you know, public um, uh, celebration of the contact model. Okay, that was that was a lot. Um, now we have open time for questions um, about the contact models, but why, how, when, who, where? Um, any questions about contact models? Um, uh, we've got plenty of time here. We can chat. Um, if you have questions, just unmute um, or put them in chat. 